Have you ever wondered what might have happened if Soviet Russia had won the legendary space race? Most people might know how extremely committed Russia was to become the first nation to reach the moon, but they do not realize how close the USSR actually came to achieving their feat. Neither do they understand the true extent of the Soviet Union's plans. If it weren't for some errors, insufficient funding, and the loss of a key figure, history as we know it might have been very different. Join us today as we dive deep into the history of the space race and break down major events from its start right up until the point when Soviet Russia abandoned their plan entirely. Let's start from the very beginning. On the 2nd of August 1955, the USSR kicked things off officially by announcing a plan to launch their first man-made satellite in response to an earlier declaration made by the US. The long-term goal was simple. Whoever gets the first man on the moon wins the race. However, America was not expecting the Soviet Union to outpace them this quickly. The US had planned to launch their first satellite in 1958, named Explorer 1. Little did they know the Soviet Union had taken the early start by launching their own satellite named Sputnik 1 on the 4th of October 1957, claiming the prize of the first artificial Earth satellite to be launched in history. After one month on the 3rd of November, Russia launched yet another spacecraft named Sputnik 2, marking this as their second victory against the US. This time carrying a Soviet space dog named Laika, another Russian satellite had entered orbit. This feat was even greater as they became the first nation to send a living organism into orbit. Finally, after pushing through strict deadlines, the US launched their first satellite, named Explorer 1 on the 31st of January in 1958, officially joining the Russian ones in Earth's orbit. This was a massive relief for the US because they were able to prove they are not that far behind. Another major achievement claimed by the US was the launch of SCORE, the world's first communication satellite, in December of 1958. SCORE left everyone in awe as it broadcasted a pre-recorded Christmas message by the US President Dwight D. Eisenhower to the entire world. This is the President of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite. This became the first human voice to be broadcasted from space in history. While the US was thinking about the upper orbit, Russia was adamantly set on sending a rocket to the moon. On the 2nd of January 1959, the USSR launched their first cosmic rocket, named Luna 1. This was not a complete success, however, because it accidentally escaped the moon's orbit due to its excessive speed. However, it still did become the first man-made object to escape the Earth's gravitation and orbit the Sun instead. And on the 12th of September 1959, Russia was finally able to stick the landing with Luna 2 as it successfully reached the surface of the Moon. That was a major achievement, but what came next solidified the superiority of the USSR in the space race. The Soviet Union claimed the feat of sending the first man into space. Yuri Gagarin, a Russian cosmonaut, became the first man to orbit the Earth on the 12th of April 1961 and landed back in West Russia. Now, this was a historic feat which clearly signified that the US was lagging behind and that the USSR was going to claim the prize. If you were to ask people back then, most would bet that Russia would become the first nation to reach the moon. They clearly showed their dominance in the space race with the fact that they were competent enough to engineer a craft which could not only launch a human into space, but also land them back on Earth safely. Another major accomplishment claimed by Russia was of Alexei Leonov, who left his spacecraft, the Voshkod 2, and conducted a 12-minute spacewalk in a specialized spacesuit. Nothing like this was even thought to be possible. This fact removed any leftover doubts and proved that the achievement of building a moon base is somewhere in the near future. But then, what happened? Well, the plan was actually robust and well thought of. The vehicle to be used was the N1L3 Super Heavy Vehicle, an absolute behemoth which consisted of two rings of rocket engines. The outer ring was made up of 24 engines and an inner ring of six engines with steering gimbals. The base was a staggering 17 meters in diameter 
and the thrust produced by this super-heavy vehicle was over 10 million pounds, a power that was unrivaled until recently in 2021 when SpaceX built their first Starship Super Heavy. Now, once the fuel burns off, N1 would give way to a separate set of eight engines called Block B, which would further be shed off to give way to Block C containing four engines. The overall thrust created by these separate segments would act as the driving force to reach the outer orbit. On the other end of the Super Heavy vehicle is the lunar stack made up of two separate modules, the LOK orbiter which was designed to orbit the moon and the LK lander through which the Soviet astronauts would land on the surface of the moon. In order to make sure these two modules would reach the lunar orbit, a fourth block was supposed to be used to give it effective amounts of thrust. And after the shedding of this fourth block, the fifth and final stage would be left, which would slow the craft down to stabilize it in orbit. Once stabilized, one of the two cosmonauts would perform a spacewalk from the command module into the LK lander. The LK lander would then undock entirely and use the fifth stage engines to perform a soft touchdown on the surface of the moon. The Soviet cosmonaut would then get out of the lander and explore the surface of the moon for a few hours and plant the Soviet flag as a symbol of their triumphant achievement. With a few lunar rocks in his hand, the cosmonaut would then get back into the lander and use the thrusts to reach back onto LOK. After docking the lander back with the LOK orbiter, the cosmonaut would then spacewalk back into the command module and use the thrusters to begin their journey back towards Earth. After finally entering the orbit, the landing would be a standard procedure where the LOK would separate into three modules and the center crew capsule would make a parachute landing in a Soviet desert. This might seem like a major achievement for most, but for the Soviet Union, this was only phase one of the space race. Phase two consisted of building a lunar base named Zvezda. Zvezda was an intricately thought out base made up of nine connected modules housing up to 12 cosmonauts. The diameter of these modules would be around 3.3 meters and the length would be only 4.5 meters while transporting them to the surface of the moon. Once reached, they could be expanded by air pressure in a telescopic manner, reaching a final length of 8.6 meters. Every single module would be fabricated on Earth, and they were believed to have their own purpose. These were namely the Command Module, Workshop Module, Medical and Fitness Module, Midpoint Module, Laboratory and Warehouse Module, Galley Module with a Dining Room, and three Living Modules. These modules would be covered by tons of regolith, which is essentially the loose rocky layer which sits atop the bedrock. These modules would be transported by the same magnificent monstrosities which were the N1 L3 vehicles. Now comes the hard task of building this base up on the harsh surface of the moon. The construction itself would be broken down to three phases which are extremely tricky to understand. Regarding the power supply, the Russian scientists had thought up of building a small nuclear fission reactor and nuclear batteries. Multiple tests were done on Earth and these modules were created for experimental purposes, which in turn added even more intricate details to their plan. The final design also contained false windows, which would show scenic views of the countryside of Russia. These views would also show different weathers in sync with the current weather in the Russian countryside. An exercise bike was also added to the medical and fitness module, which would project scenes from the countryside as well. Call it a primitive form of virtual reality in order to maintain the cosmonaut's mental and physical health. Now, I'm sure this might sound like something out of a science fiction movie, but it gets even more impressive. The Soviet Union had a plan to install a lunar train as well, which would run on prefabricated tracks. The lunar train would be made up of four separate modules itself. The front module would be the engine or the tug, the second would be the crew compartment, the third being the energy production module, and the fourth module would be a giant drilling rig used for gathering resources from the moon's regolith. This was the pinnacle of their design and to pull off such a feat would definitely make them superior to their American counterparts. 
However, fate was not as favorable towards their plans as you might think it would be. You see, everything regarding their overarching plan was based on one core component, the N1 L3 Super Heavy Vehicle. It was absolutely essential for the vehicle to be robust with the most minimal room for error if this plan was to become a reality. This means that the most important person in this long-term plan was the engineer of this spacecraft named Sergei Korolev, a person who never hesitated to think out of the box and dream big. Now Korolev had thought of a very complicated design for the fuel system for the N1 engine. This comprised of liquid oxygen and kerosene. This cutting-edge rocket technology was also used by the American rocket scientist Werner von Braun in his massive F1 engines. All of the five blocks of the N1 L3 vehicle were to use this rocket fuel and technology. Now here is where a massive blow was dealt to the USSR space program. Sergei Korolev died unexpectedly on the 14th of January 1966, months before he could witness his brainchild take flight up into the heavens. And surprisingly, the cause of his death was somewhat mysterious to say the least. Korolev died during a routine surgery for a bleeding polyp in his lower intestine. The government declared that he had a large cancerous tumor in his abdomen. However, a rival scientist by the name of Valentin Glushko later reported that he died due to a poorly performed surgery for hemorrhoids. What an unfortunate way to go. Sadly, after the demise of Korolev, no one was able to look after the long-term planning of the N1 rockets. The next leader to take up such a central role in this major plan was Vasily Mishin, the man people claim to be the underlying cause of the failure of the USSR in the space race. Under his leadership, the N1 rocket ended up becoming a huge failure. During the first test flight, engines of the N1 rocket began to malfunction, causing it to vibrate violently just a few meters after its takeoff. This caused the N1 rocket to crash near the launch pad. The second test flight was somehow even worse. Just after the takeoff, 29 of the 30 engines began to malfunction, causing the N1 rocket to drop back onto the launch pad, ending in the biggest non-nuclear explosion in history. The shockwaves of this explosion were powerful enough to shatter windows 40 kilometers away in every direction. Now, all of this happened just two weeks before the launch of the US Apollo 11 flight, which ended up successfully putting men on the moon. The damage done by the second test flight of the N-1 had pushed the Soviet Union space plans further back than they had anticipated. It took them a staggering 18 months to rebuild their launch complex, and by then, the US had reached the moon a multitude of times, claiming it as their final victory in the space race. All we have now are just a series of imaginative scenarios where the USSR could have succeeded. Maybe we might be living in a completely different timeline if Sergei Korolev would have survived the operation or if the N1 launch had succeeded. Maybe in that timeline we would have had an entire city on the moon by now. Or maybe we could have been exploring deep space, forming small colonies on celestial bodies light years away from us with the US still competitively building bases as well. For now, these ideas are only a part of fantasy until someone else comes along to leave their mark in the history books and actually achieves this long-thought-out plan of living amongst the stars.